So what companies in this cell agriculture field need to do is help, is help make sure they're communicating right away, not just how the products are made, not the one, two, three steps on how we can take a cell and make it into meat, but also this idea of why. Why are companies looking to do this? Why are scientists so excited about the idea of applying cutting edge cell biology into the food sector? Why are we looking into this? And, and from what surveys have been done in the past, if you explain to the public the why from the environmental sustainability aspects by requiring less resources than conventional animal agriculture for the same products to the potential public health implications of the clean and sterile environment of using cells directly, people are more understanding and understand, ah, this is why. All right, if this, if, if this is done appropriately and regulated appropriately, I would be open to it. It's all about that communication than that idea of radical transparency to make sure that people understand their food system. Ahmed Khan as my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Ahmed is a cellular agriculture consultant and the founder and editor of Cell Agri, a news and market insight startup focusing on the future of food with cellular agriculture. Cell Agri provides the latest updates and insights on a range of topics and trends relating to cellular agriculture field. Cell Agri's platform also tracks all the major and upcoming players in the field, providing them with the ability to post, share their latest news and job openings. Ahmed is the co-founder and member of the Board of Directors of Cellular Agriculture Canada, a nonprofit organization advancing and promoting the cellular agriculture industry in Canada. Ahmed has previously spoken about cellular agriculture and leading food tech conferences around the world, including in Canada, England, Singapore, and the United States. Ahmed first learned about cellular agriculture while studying at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Ahmed, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you can make it. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm glad you can make it and it's great to have you here. So I've been following your work. I've been getting the eBooks and the reports. I, I was at the recent um, uh, Asia Summit that you held, Cellular Agriculture Asia Summit, which was in May of this year. Fabulous event, fabulous speakers, and the leaders um, from the cell ag industry, they're talking and giving us really in-depth insights uh, of what's going on. As you know, uh, the pandemic and uh, all the craziness, other craziness that we've seen in this past 15 plus months, hopefully that we're emerging out of it, has had a real big impact on food and protein and agriculture and, and many other things during this crazy time. And I want to know, how have you weathered this crazy time? And did you see any new models emerge or any new insights that uh, you're saying, wow, this is really a, a good solution in times when we're facing a pandemic or food issues or anything that was of interest to, uh, that emerged for you? And how did you weather the time? Are you, are you okay? Did you make it through? Are you emerging stronger? Uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, 2020 was certainly an unprecedented time in terms of the pandemic and its devastating impact around the world. But I've been very fortunate. I've been here in Dubai with my family. Personally, my plan was to be a bit more remote with my work in 2020. That wasn't able to happen. But overall, very, fort very fortunate on how things have turned out from my family and on my side. Looking at the bigger food picture, I think the pandemic has brought up a lot of questions in terms of how do we get our food currently? How, do, how does our current food supply chain look like? And also brought the conversation up on the food security side for many. For, for many for many in the US and Canada, for example, it was the first time they saw empty grocery, grocery store shelves. The whole question about how can we improve the resiliency in our food supply chain emerged. And through that, a lot more, there was a lot more interest in future food technologies, including cell agriculture in the process. Um, I'm so glad that, that you saw that as well. I was seeing many different things, good, bad, and ugly uh, coming out of this. And, and luckily, we've, we're really at the cusp of, uh, of a lot of different things. So 2020, the, the, 
uh, UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres came out and says we're going to have the UN Food System Summit. And because of the pandemic, that kind of got delayed until this year. And well, this year we have the pre-summit and, and the main summit. And really the focus on food and how our food systems are broken and the many things that needed to be addressed where alternative and alternative proteins are, are a big factor in that and cellular agriculture uh, is a factor and that really is still kind of emerging as a discussion on international stage what alternatives what are innovations and things are are coming up that that we should be looking at to help fix our food systems to not only produce enough food in the future but also maybe do things that produce food without harm to human health and our environment and so that i'm really excited to have you here because you are the one of the wizards and experts in, in this area and you made lots of focus in, in in what you do to to be very knowledgeable and have your finger on the pulse of of where the industry is going what's emerging what are the myths and the controversies and you publish uh, a bunch of different things so i'll, I'll kind of look for the listeners I'll, I'll let them know about that is you do an investment report on your website about how the industry is receiving investments, which is a, a good indicator of growth and what the trends are and things like that. You do a five-day guided course um, uh, specifically for those who need more knowledge and kind of what's this all about and how to understand it, which is, is fabulous uh, that you do. But the real pinnacle that has drawn me and my, I would say probably most of our listeners or those who are interested in this space is your wonderful ebook, which uh, uh, on cellular agriculture. And it's basically the A to Z compendium. And it's a, it's really a guide for, I mean, uh, it's probably not doing it justice to say, uh, sell ag for dummies, so to say, but it's it's it, it's really a beautiful guide that gives this list of what to understand, what are the myths, what are the controversies, how to understand it, who are the players in the system, what is the technology, and you just list this so nicely. You give us an introductory to bio biology, and I, I was lucky enough to get the 2021 report, which just came out in May, and, and read that. Um, Around the same time I attended your event, the, the Asia Summit, which, which was beautiful. And uh, I, I want you to kind of tell us more about the guide and how we should understand it and why you decided to come out with this and, and where it's developing and where it's going. Yeah, thank you for those kind words, Mark. Really appreciate it. I guess the story of how the ebook came about is very similar to the story of how even Cell Agri began. I first learned about the field back in 2017. and I have a background in cell biology and I was blown away, blown away by the whole concept of how the, of this field and how it could have both implications for our, our future food system and our environmental sustainability as well. But at the time I was having a problem. There was no one-stop resource that had all the latest news insights, job opportunities, or even investment reports on what was going on in the field. And that's how Salagri began to be a one-stop platform for people to come to learn literally anything and everything about cell agriculture, what it is and how it works who are some of the different players in the field and what are different opportunities and insights to get involved, involved with. To help further raise awareness for the field, I, I first published the ebook in 2019, as like you mentioned, an in-depth introduction to the cell agriculture field, giving an overview of how it works, why does this field even matter, and some of the challenges and controversies for the field to move forward. So that's, that, was, that was originally the idea of that, but as opposed to just one ebook, the field's been changing so much each year that we have to update it every year to help keep, keep, keep our readers up to date with, what, with what's going on to help them understand what, not just what this field is, but also why it's important to move forward for our future food system. That's great. And, and we're going to go into a little, a few additional points that are covered in there, but I don't really want to, um, I don't want to give it all away. I would like people to go to your website and <clears throat> and signed up for you know either the email course or a kind of the five day course on the deep dive or to download the ebook or somehow get involved with you um, to, to get more wisdom and information on that. That's really factual and unbiased. So you you really represent the the good, bad, and ugly and everyone in the field. <clears throat> 
no matter what, and there's no bias and excuse me, prejudice on any of that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Which, which I really, I really like, and we, uh, is important for to to remain unbiased in in the industry and get the facts so that we can make our own decisions on on where it's going. Um, you you also are became a media partner, which is fairly recent for the new food conference, which is um, put on by Pro Veg and Pro Veg and uh, Pro Veg and even even Good Food Institute were really when they started, which are also in some respects kind of newer organizations, very vegan based, you know, no animal cruelty, um, beyond vegetarian, really vegan, no animals at all. And uh, as I've seen them develop over the years, they they all have really come to even a, em, embrace in some respects the cell agriculture movement and, and alters because it's non-invasive for animals and it doesn't harm or kill animals. Um, there are some methods that, that we'll discuss in a bit that, that are probably not so good for animals um, and they're non-GMO and, and many other great things that, that most people don't understand. And so, um, the reason I, I, I bring that out is because really that's where I want to uh, address the first kind of questions is food is something that's a global citizen. It's for everybody in the world and it's our, our basic resource. And so I want to ask, how do you feel about global citizenship, global trade uh, of food and products? And how would you feel about a world without borders and nations and divisions of humanity one from a another. And the reason I ask that is because there are a few things that are global citizens. One is food, air, water, species, you know, animals, and uh, definitely the COVID, you know, the crisis, the pandemic, it was a global citizen from the get go and grew exponentially. And so what are your feelings towards this? And then let's, once you answer that, I want to get more into uh, some of the myths and misconceptions around uh, cell ag. That's a really interesting idea. Food is a global citizen. I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. People all around the world, they share their own culture and almost their own identity to the food that they have and the food that they bring around the world. So it's definitely a key part of identity and creating our global food system. We get foods, fruit and vegetables from all over the world right now. If you go to, if you go to your local supermarket, you have foods that are grown on the other half of the world, which is just a highlight of how our food system has really improved over the, over the past decades to be what it is today. To that same extent, um, when it comes to future food technologies and helping support our global food system and keeping food part of our global citizenship, I think we need to have food novel food tech companies and players emerge from all around the world to make sure that different food cultures are are expressed and shown in these new technologies to make sure that we keep this idea of food being a part of our global food being a global citizen and how and keep keep that going so the 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 kind of the controversy that was was there before for vegans or those who are very animal uh, rights um, is that that there was animal cruelty occurring, that the practices were, were not that good. And in the cell agriculture framework, the, and I caveated this in the beginning, cell agriculture is actually non-invasive. It's GMO, so it's not, G, it's not GMO, no, no genetic modification, can't even be fallen into that category. And if it's done with the right productions without uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the production part process, it can be very good for human health and the environment is producing the same type of protein and, and products that we would get from slaughtering animals, but in a much different way. And it's really uh, a, a different version. It's not really considered a high processed food either, where there's a lot of negative additives and, and, and negative stuff. It's sometimes there, but there is one point that ha has kind of a dual edged knife to it or a dual edged sword to it. And I want you to address that. And that is the fetal bovine serum. And that's always something else as well. That's bad for, to, for the animal to, to extract that and 
and happens to birthing animals. Can you tell us more about that and, and what the debate and discussions and how to understand that is? Yeah, sure. Um, before answering that, I think just take a step back, step back for the listeners who are learning about cell agriculture for the first time. Yeah, yeah. So cell agriculture is the field of producing animal products like meat, dairy, and even products like leather directly from cells instead of raising animals for those exact same products. So instead of raising, let's say, a cow from birth for the meat, dairy, and leather, you can take cells and train those cells to produce the exact same products. One of the products that we can make through cell agriculture is meat. And, one, and, and the way that, and to keep it brief, the way that simply works is you take a biopsy, a small injection from an animal of interest, let's say a cow, cow for the time being, and, you, and from that biopsy, there are cells in that called stem cells. And those are cells that have the ability to divide into more cells as well as specialize and differentiate into becoming different types of cells, let, let's say mus muscle cells and fat cells and other types of cells you find within a meat product. So those stem cells are put into a nutrient broth, a nutrient formulation called the cell culture media. And at scale, these stem cells and the cell culture media formulation would be in a large bioreactor, think brewery tank, and the output of that would be a cell cultured meat product or, or what I call cell based meat. Now, one of the main ingredients that's going to be required into producing cell based meat at scale is the cell culture media formulation. And that entirely contains, and that process essentially contains everything the cells will need to survive, essentially making them think they're still inside the body of the animal the vitamins, the nutrients, the hormones, the growth factors, essentially everything. Currently at the lab bench scale for many in the bio research area, the, uh, an ingredient called the fetal bovine serum is used to help add all those nutrients that cells would need in the research environment to grow and thrive. Um, one of the controversies and challenges for the cell agriculture ecosystem, if one of the goals is to entirely remove animals from the food process, is to use that use that ingredient because as the name suggests, it is taken from the fetal, the fetal, a fetal cough of a cow, usually during the time of slaughter of the mother cow. And so that's a challenge for the field. Um, along with the animal welfare side of that, one of the major challenges of using FBS is the cost point of it. FBS comes in small doses and it's pretty expensive and the, and the, and the consistency and quality varies from batch to batch. So at a large scale production facility, that could be a problem. One of the best examples of this is the idea. Back in 2019, I was in Singapore at the time when a company there called Shiok Meats showcased the first ever cell-based shrimp dumplings. They showcased about eight dumplings at the time. And, and those eight dumplings cost over $5,000 to produce, just eight of them. And according to the Shiok Meat team, at the time, the majority of that cost was a cell culture media formation because for that small scale, they had to use FBS. Now, they, at the time, they stated that if they were able to find an affordable and animal-free cell culture media formulation alternative, that cost could drop all the way from $5,000 all the way down to $50. That's a big change. So that's why a lot of companies right now are looking to get rid of the FBS in the, in the process and make it animal-free so it's also be more affordable to scale production as well. Uh, that the controversy uh, around that. Oh, ab absolutely. And the, the fetal bovine serum FBS is, uh, is interesting because I didn't know that, that for the shrimp, the shiok meats does uh, seafood and cr crustaceans, uh, basically shellfish um, right now, uh, that they use a beef, fetal bovine serum <laughs> to make a seafood, so to say, which is very interesting to know. Um, yeah, for on instance, that idea I, of the seafood, yeah. sorry to cut you off there, but there's not, there hasn't been much research done on the stem cell biology of seafood animals. So initially, if you had to find a cell culture media formulation, a beef serum, a FBS may have been used at that very initial stage, not because it, it, it's the best one, but because there's no other alternative out there. So now as more companies are exploring seafood, I'm sure companies are going to figure out What's the best alternative to use for seafood specifically? That's more that's animal free and also inexpensive and just optimal for seafood cells. And then um, the, along with that process, so when you do the scaffolding, when you grow, when you kind of do the 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 serum and uh, whatever type of serum or broth that you're talking about, uh, the 
growth medium to feed those cells. Um, the, there's a lot of difference on the time and, and the process that that takes. And, and I'm an advisor for Aleph uh, Farms that has done the first uh, cell agriculture steak, full grown steak, and, and they're doing it in about three weeks. And it's still on the R and D and lab phase. Um, but what are you what are you seeing in in others around for time frames on that lab process? And and is there really more struggles or things that are emerging as far as what is the growth medium? Where are they going to get those nutrients and and things to feed the cells from? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So like you said, um, some, some companies are, have already have come out stating they, their cells can double in about three weeks time, which is, which I think is pretty great actually. Um, compared to, I mean, three weeks compared to raising a whole animal from, for many years, it's a lot more efficient already off the bat. When it comes to these, these companies and, their, and, the, and scaling and making their product process more efficient, there are going to be a lot of scaling challenges along the way, moving from that lab bench scale to all the way to commercial production. And while it's, the cell culture media formulation is going to be a major aspect of that in terms of how can we encourage cells to, how, how can we feed our cells more efficiently and, make, and try to encourage them to grow, grow as much as optimally as they possibly can. And I think that's going to be one of the major things companies look at when they look, when they look to scale. Ideally, they first find those, those cells from the animal of interest that can ideally become immortalized and continue to replicate to become more and more cells, almost 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 to think of like an infinite sort infinite source of meat, and then go those in a cell culture media formulation at scale. You you you'll require thousands and thousands and thousands of liters of the cell culture media formulation. How are you gonna make sure that one it's affordable, two it's the best one out there, and if, if you if you're having it in a large bioreactor, how are you gonna make sure that you add the inputs and remove the out, the waste products as well to make sure that the cells are growing in a healthy, safe environment to be more, to be the best optimal outcome. So when it comes to scaling, that's me, those are two of the main challenges. I touched on this idea of bioreactor technology as well. Some companies in the field talk about bioreactors to the scale of like 20,000 liter plus. And while that works fine for breweries and like brewery vats, those aren't animal cells in particular. Those are yeast cells and other microorganisms Animal cells are a lot more sensitive. How, how, how would those cells be able to grow in such large vats? Would, would, would it be good for them? Would they even survive? These are some of the challenges that the field definitely needs to address in terms of scaling. And that's one of the many factors they're, they're going to be looking towards. That's amazing. Do you, um, can, can you actually address the GMO um, aspect of that and how we can better understand that so that there uh, to to clear up any misconceptions some people how can it be gmo and all this and uh it's cell ag okay sure thing so gmo stands for genetic modified organism and it's essentially the science of adding the dna or gene of interest from one organism to another organism to produce a specific outcome whether protein of interest or for let's say crops enhance the enhance the out the output of it. When it comes to cellular agriculture, I'll say this right away, for cell-based meat, companies have all stated they're not looking to modify the cells. The, the end product will not be a genetically modified organism. So that's off the bat. But having said that, when, when, when we look at the bigger picture of food technology and communications around that, there are a lot of lessons that companies using cellular agriculture to produce food products can learn from the mistakes of when GMO products first came to market. Monsanto. You said it. <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when those products, when Monsanto first came to market with their genetically modified seeds to help farmers, they did not take it, they did not believe it was their responsibility to communicate to the wider public what the technology is or how it works, or most, and most, most importantly, why. Why are they doing this to their food system? In their mind, all they had to do was sell to food producers, and that was the end for them. And it was, it, the onus was on them to communicate to the public. But that never happened. And what emerged was this, this public with a wide, a wide gap of public knowledge on this novel food technology at the time. Is it safe? What is it? Can I feed it to my kids? And most importantly, why? Why are scientists and companies looking to do this? Why are they looking to add this to our, our food system? 
And what emerged was a public that distrusted this, this technology, especially because other actors with other vested interests came in and filled the public knowledge with other information. And because of that, I think in the bigger picture, we still live in an anti-GMO era because of that. So what companies in this cell agriculture field need to do is help, is help make sure they're communicating right away, not just how the products are made, not their one, two, three steps on how we can take a cell and make it into meat, but also this idea of why. Why are companies looking to do this? Why are scientists so excited about the idea of applying cutting edge cell biology into the food sector? Why are we looking into this? And, and from what surveys have been done in the past, if you explain to the public the why from the environmental sustainability aspects by requiring less resources than conventional animal agriculture for the same products to the potential public health implications of using of the, of the clean and sterile environment of using cells directly, people are more understanding and understand, ah, this is why. All right, if this, if, if this is done appropriately and regulated appropriately, I would be open to it. It's all about that communication and that idea of radical transparency to make sure that people understand their food system. Um, I, like, I like to say context is everything and with food, it matters so much more. Oh, it does. It's, uh, uh, a lot of people don't, believe it or not, don't want to put innovation in their mouth. They want to understand it for first and how it works. And even though we would call it an innovation, uh, innovation or um, alternate protein or, or whatever we choose to label it, then they're like, well, well, that's something I just don't understand. Please clarify and why and how and that communication is so vital so we can make that connection on how we associate our life and how our interaction with, with food um, is usually not one that, uh, even though a lot of foods, especially high processed foods, all start in the lab uh, in some respects and, and mixing of flavors and aromas and many other things. Uh, it's just this other report. And you're very good through your ebook to the communication, the non-bias, and give us all sides of the good, bad, and the ugly of what <laughs> what is what is in, in needed to know to understand, and so that we can make informed, um, smart choices on on how we go forward and how we feel about those things, and that and that's really uh, a big aspect of what you do. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about. Uh, uh, the way you, you believe that that uh, the communication needs to occur or move forward in, in the industry, um, because that's what you do. You're kind of, in some respects, a media partner, not just as at conferences, but in the book and in educating people on that communication strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, from from my from my viewpoint, I think communication is one of the most important things that the agriculture field will need to do to succeed in the in the long run we can uh, we can address all the technical challenges from you know the cell lines to the cell culture media formulation to um yet to yet to be seen by reactive technologies and even scaffolding but ultimately at the end of the day if if you don't communicate this properly to consumers they're not going to buy it and ultimately it comes down to con public and public and consumer perception at the end of the day um, I think that's why it's so important that you have players like Celagri out there communicating. This is what's currently happening in the field. This is the reality. This this is the aim, but we're not there yet. And how can we ensure that we hold everyone accountable to make sure that they're working on addressing these challenges to improve our food system? So, yeah, we do we we do do a lot of communications, and that helps keep everyone up to date with the latest news on what these companies are actually doing on to advance their mission as well as what other players in the field are doing as well to help support grow the field overall. Maybe you could help with a, a little bit more understanding. So there's a lot of terms because, because yeah. it's an academic field or it's, uh, it's also a, um, a, a trade, uh, there are certain specific languages towards, towards cellular agriculture. Some of the terms we've heard is cell ag, we've heard of cultured meat, we've heard of in vitro meat, or in Germany it's called in vitro fleisch, which to me is like, oh, that seems like something to do with baby making or implanting something. <laughs> it seems to me kind of weird, that term. Maybe you can uh, help us with some of those definitions and what's out there, and are they different, or are they basically saying all the same things? Those are just the emerging terms. 
I haven't heard the German term before. That's really interesting. Is, is, is that a popular term being used in Germany yeah, right now? Yeah, in Germany, it's really still uh, called in vitro Fleisch, which Fleisch is meat, but uh, it's really a big thing here. And to me, it, mm, and it's, it seems like in vitro fertilization, what, what someone would go through if they want to have a baby, so. Yeah, that does not sound very appetizing. <laughs> but you're absolutely right, Mark. There are so many different terms that are just being that have been used in the past and are currently being used by different sectors and different in terms of the communication side as well. So historically, up in the term in B, let's say prior to I want to say before prior to 2013, the the, the academic community used the phrase in vitro meat to explore the idea. Then they realized the idea of cell culture meat may be more accurate because they're cell culturing the cells to become a meat product. And for the longest time, culture meat became the, the known phrase that's used in academia. And to this day, when general groups talk about the academic side of this field, they say cultured meat. Um, but at the same time, while academia is going up, is pursuing this field in the, in the, in the research side, there are companies and other players that have emerged looking at the field in a different lens, the more commercial, the more business side. And cultured meat, while it's very descriptive, doesn't um, appeal to the consumer side as much or to the public communication side of the benefits of this of using cell culture technology. Um, so a lot, a lot of terms have been used in the, have been used that, that, that have been thrown around. Clean meat was popular for a little while, but I'm glad that's we, we moved on from that. Cultivated meat has is being used as well as on cell agri, we use the phrase cell-based meat as well. Um, when it comes to the government reg regulation side, lot, two, ter two terms have been used a lot, cultured meat and cell-based meat. And if that's, a, if that's a term regulators are going to use to approve this field, cell agri, is, cell agri is using that phrase as well currently, cell-based meat. Having said that, if, if future research shows that the, field, the term cultivated meat or even something like cell-cultivated um, emerges popular, that could be something the whole field may adopt in the future if that's consistent and is, and is the best term to use. But for the, for the time being, we have cultured meat, we have cultivated meat, and from the cell agri perspective, cell-based meat as well. The original um, times that these cell-based meats have come out are um, almost kind of a novelty experience and very much promoted but also the cost of that initial tasting or that initial production is just enormous it's outrageous and um is is something more like a, a it's, a, it's almost comparable to what we're going through in in the space race with uh, elon musk and jeff bezos he just sold i, I think it was 28 million or something like that uh a ticket to ride along on his uh, Blue Origin just to go up to outer space. And, and in some respects, food obviously is, all, 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 thank goodness, not in the millions, but it's it's it's, it's tickling the surface of a very expensive um, out there for these initial tastings or to production because it's not a scale, because it's still in this novelty space to some respects. And, and that's kind of where I want to uh, make a distinction and maybe have you uh, bring something more out on that. Mm -hmm. So in the USDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as well, as well as the European food standards and that Europe, it's called a novel food. And so to get permitting to produce that and to start selling it on, on the market, you, you need this novel food permit. And maybe you could tell us why they throw it in that range um, and also discuss the USDA and the FDA and who's kind of over the authority of regulating this, but also who's the one who's saying, okay, now it's free to go on the market and everybody can have it, it's safe and, and we're regulating it. And why does it fall under novel? What does that mean? Is it because of the novelty, like I mentioned on the high price, or uh, uh, how do we understand that? Yeah, sure. Um, before going to the regulation side, you mentioned the idea of the, the, uh, the high prices. And you're right. In 2013, um, Dutch scientist, Dr. Mark Post and his team showcased the first ever lab-grown beef, beef, beef burger at the cost of over $300,000 for just one for just one cell grilling beef patty. And while that was a, certainly an astronomical price then, the field is, is developing and, and is moving forward. 
at the end of 2020, um, under the idea of regulation, Singapore became the first country to give regulatory approval for the sa sale of cell cultured meat. And one, the one company, Eat Just, and its subsidiary, Good Meat, sold the first cell cultured chicken nugget in, in that country. Um, from $300,000 for one beef patty, we've come down to $23 for one, small, for one chicken nugget. So it's still expensive for a chicken nugget, but compared to $300,000 just seven years earlier, the field is definitely moving in the right direction in terms of the cost side to be less sky high, so to speak. When it comes to, in terms of the regulation side, I'll touch on Singapore in a bit, but you're right. In the EU, cell cultured meat and I think overall, some style agriculture food products in general will be re regulated under the novel food directive. One of the reasons why is it's, it's, it, cell cultured meat generally falls under that is, I, is generally the novelty of the concept of gro growing meat products directly from cells. We have used cells to grow medicines and uh, some food ingredients, but never to grow actual meat, whereas the actual cell is part of the end product per, per se. So through that lens, this is a brand new concept that hasn't been done before. So I think that's why cell-cultured meat generally falls under the novelty aspect. And in the EU, that's how cell-based meat products will be regulated. In the US, it, it, it hasn't been such a simple answer. It's actually been quite, it's actually been quite interesting. From 2018, in 2018, the US Department of Agriculture, the USDA, and the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, have both been almost arguing about who would have jurisdiction over this field. In 2018, both the USD and FDA both came out saying, we have jurisdiction over this field. And that went back and forth for a little while until end of 2018, a framework came together that for the first time, both the USD and FDA will be regulating cell culture meat together. And that's a bit unprecedented in the US. There's been no time before where both the USDA and the FDA have joined up to re re regulate one's field. And it, it almost makes sense. The USDA is specifically responsible for the regulation of meat, dairy, and eggs, and also catfish. And the FDA is responsible for the regulation of cell cultured products, as well as other food products, including, major, including most seafoods. So what happens if you're having a product that's made from cell cultures, but is a meat product? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get the best of both um, departments? And that's what, what, what we've gotten, a joint re re regulatory framework involving both the USDA and the FDA. In 2019, a framework came out announcing that the FDA will be in charge of regulating the first parts of cell, of cell culturing meat up until what you would call the harvest stage. And after that point in time, the USDA would be regulating it like they would regulate most meat production. So that's how regulation is going to look like in the US. Since that basic framework came out in 2019, there has not been much more of an update from their side. Hopefully we'll hear more soon about what, this, what the next steps would look like for a detailed regulatory system for cell cultured meat. At the same time, while this conversation has been happening in the US and Europe, Singapore and the other side of the world has been working, has been working for the last two years and finally got their own re regulatory framework out for cell-based meat. And after working with the company Eat Just for more than two years on evaluating the safety and working with different experts from around the world to make sure that this is safely, that can be safely done and re regulated appropriately, they came up with their own framework. And for, for that reason, Singapore is becoming a leading food tech hub in, around the world, where many, many cell based meat companies actually are looking at coming to Singapore, that small island nation, as their Asia hub to, to launch their first product and expand, expand from there phenomenal i love that yeah that's absolutely amazing and uh, i i really want to also um dive dive well I, I don't know if we want to dive more into the regulatory but that's really been emerging there has been some things that have happened just in um this last two two years um that have been really interesting there was a huge controversy about using the term meat and, and that, and then been some lawsuits. And so not only pro-veg, but also um, um, Good Food Institute have gotten involved in some lawsuits and, and litigation and trying to work with the governments and those organizations to, to combat against that. So they, 
can't call sell ag meat or can you can call it that and then on by, vice versa and i know this isn't sell ag but it's tied to precision fermentation and tied to the the, the animal agriculture is the milk industry there was a the big thing that pro veg really played a big part in um, as well around the term using milk on plant-based products and things like that and so and that also falls into this novel but also into these regulatory areas i don't know if you want to tell tell us a little bit of how that's emerged and, and what's come out is it allowed to be called meat and is it allowed to be called milk and and maybe something like that if if that plays into to what's been going on as well yeah sure so along with the regulation side of proving of establishing a framework of how can we produce cell-based meat that is that is safely done another aspect of the re regulatory framework is going to be the labeling aspect once the product is done what is it going to be called and it's actually been interesting that in the u.s that's been a major that's been a major challenge usually from Beef and ca beef cattlemen associations in, across the, across the country there, um, stating that both plant-based products as well as cell agriculture products cannot use terms that can be reserved for traditional meat products. Um, that's specifically the term meat, and that I think that'll be an interesting conversation for how regulators look at our food system moving forward. Frankly, traditionally we've, I mean, meat is tr traditionally def defined as the idea of flesh derived from the carcass of an animal. And that's just the definition because that's how we've always gotten meat. You, you have to take it from the carcass of an animal. But what if in the future we can make the exact same meat so that you look at it under the microscope, it's the exact same muscle cells, fat cells, connective tissue, exactly the same, exact same nutrient profile, if not better, same taste and same texture. If you can make the exact same meat product without requiring, the, without requiring that flesh to be derived from a carcass, can you still call it meat? Us, us in the cell agriculture field states, believe, believe we can. And therefore, it, it is meat, and so that's going to be interesting conversation moving forward for the reg, on the re regulatory labeling side. In Singapore, I believe the phrase they're using right now is cultured meat specifically, so that's so they're allowed to use the term meat there. So Great. on the cultured meat side, that that'll be a question, and on the dairy side, that I cannot comment on that. I'm not uh, I'm not as aware of that side, but it will be important for them. If you can make the exact same dairy milk without, without a few um, proteins, let's say like lactose or sugars like lactose, how can you still call it milk if it's the exact same product just, just without requiring the calendar process? Yeah, there's some pretty big lobbyists and organizations who are really worried about their loss on, on those things. And, and uh, the, there was a big, um, through ProVeg and many others who were really trying to combat some of the EU regulation and regulation in the states around whether you could call it milk and, and things like that. And many had already switched like Oatly to calling it something else and saying no non-milk or no not milk and things like that. And that that battle has been finally won because the cons the consistency and the makeup and the things are, are very similar and it's a different form of precision fermentation. So there's some wonderful things that are happening around the world during a time of lockdown and pandemic and craziness because food is such a vital uh, uh, part of our life and, and it's really the biggest basic need energy source for humanity. And we've given up a lot of that um, wisdom and knowledge and who produces our food to a, a few few handful or, or maybe 10 big producers in the world who control about 78 percent of all our brands and food products and um, that's not very diverse system but it's also not a very food safety secure system that that is long term for the future and so now more people are really thinking how can we fix and change that and that really comes to probably my last deep technical question for you is there's this uh, and, and it, it, it's still a very hard one to address and talk about, but I believe you have some insights and knowledge over that. And that's the one of farmers losing their jobs or farmers and how that transition from, from ranchers, farmers and animal agriculture in general, how this new cellular agriculture uh, plays into that. And and what you're seeing emerging, I, I know from those who I work with in the space, they're 
really concerned about not uh, working with the farmers uh, and working with good practices, not taking any way jobs away, not losing sources of income and livelihood, but to um, hybrid model might not be the right way, but coming up with other t ways to work and, and see that livelihood thrive and flourish and dispelling the myths of where, what they want to do or play the part in the industry. And I'd love to hear your viewpoints on what you've seen. Yeah, how would you talk about that? If that's a really interesting area to get into, one of the key socioeconomic challenges that the still agriculture field will need to address is the impact of its technology that will have on farmers across across the world. If you're producing food products directly from cells, what, what, what would that mean to the conventional animal agriculture supply chain? While that's not necessarily a question that companies in the still agriculture field or any or traditionally in any disruptive industry really quite ask, it's, it's an important one that has important political and re regulatory implications. For example, the, our past idea about the labeling question um, that, that that relates directly with this with this topic as well. How how can politicians and and um, the key decision makers make decisions that could help create our future food system more sustainably, but impacts the current their current constituents, for example. It, it's a question that has a lot of implications. So far, when it comes to what companies are actually discussing, some companies have mentioned the idea that if we can scale our technology to the point where we can make small bioreactors that are that can produce a, a product that's affordable, how about we just distribute these to farmers and instead of raising cattle, they can just um, work bioreactors to produce the same meat like they always would do. That's a big if on terms of the technology level. If we can, instead of scaling big, we can scale out and make it an, a sort of affordable product similar to what meat is currently costs, because otherwise that could be a challenge if people, if, if, if it's too costly. Other ideas what people are exploring is the idea of helping create a supply chain around conventional farm animal agriculture farmers to today. Cell lines are constantly, are, are may likely, may constantly be required if, if, if companies cannot find a way to make more to long-term cell lines and keeping farmers and constantly working with farmers to make sure that they get the right quality cells from the right quality animals. So to keep sure that they're still in, in the supply chain. Another interesting idea that could, could be used is finding ways to in, include farmers that grow crops for animal feed. Animal feed is a big industry by itself. So what if we could convert those farmers that work on raising crops for animal feed, but, 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 tra but train them to become farmers that grow crops for the cell culture media formulation, essentially the feed for cell cultured meat cells in the future. Some companies are looking into the idea of, grow of growing the, the ingredients that cell cultured meat would need directly from, in crops. So if, if, that is, if that is viable, that, that could have major implications of helping transform, easily transform conventional crop farmers into f farmers that are growing the same crops, but with the cell culture media side instead. So a lot of different ideas of how to include conventional animal agriculture farmers in the future food supply chain. Having said that at the same time, I don't think that animal agriculture is really going anywhere anytime soon. In the future, we'll have animal agriculture conventional agriculture along with cell agriculture and as well as alternative proteins. I think it's going to be part of a future food system where we have a lot of different choices. So um, while this may impact um, the market share per se and conventional animal meat, I don't think it, it'll entirely disrupt the whole industry that it all goes away tomorrow. I don't think that's realistic. Uh, can you tell us or maybe tickle the future a, li a lot, a, a, a little bit for us? You don't have a magic ball, but if you can maybe uh, touch on what you believe we will be seeing in the future and maybe also some products, what are the next things that we'll be seeing come out on the market and, and maybe give us some little insights, just your wisdom and what you're working on and what you're seeing moving in the industry and, and maybe to watch or prepare for big thing with with humanity in general uh is is timelines we don't understand how our world is growing exponentially and how and when things will be be released and how quickly that could occur or how slowly that could occur and we tend to always err and say oh that's going to be much longer but look today we're sending people to to space privately and when we're having autonomous vehicles how, how is that insight in that perspective? Can you give us that insight and maybe what, what to look for in those products? 
Sure thing. So in terms of the cell agriculture field and that moving forward, we already at the end of 2020, we saw the first commercial launch of a cell cultured meat product in Singapore. Many of the companies have come out stating that they aim to have their own cell cultured meat product also launched either in the US or even in Singapore themselves. So if that can happen before the end of 2021, that would be a big deal. Um, in terms of how people can look at this idea of like, like you mentioned, time goes by faster or than we imagine. The first cell cultured meat company came out in 2015. And in 20, and end of 2020, the first product has come to market in Singapore. That's phenomenally fast for a brand new ecosystem. So this field is moving really fast in that way from not having a regulatory system framework to having one announced a few years ago to possibly the first product in Sing from Singapore now in the US possibly by the end of 2021. That would be a big, de big deal pending regulatory approval. That's, that's, gonna be the, that, that's gonna be a key and important step to make sure this is done properly. Um, in terms of the field overall moving forward beyond just product launches, I think we're gonna see a lot more of these conventional food and agriculture companies look into cellular agriculture in terms of either, in, term, in mostly terms of partnerships. Um, when you look at some of these major companies in the, in the traditional food, agriculture, and even meat sectors, they have a lot of expertise that can help companies in this novel field scale faster and reach wider distributions than they would currently be able to do by themselves. Also for some of these companies who help that keep them relevant in the future food supply chain by partnering with some of these companies as well. But also these are interesting opportunity of possibly some pharmaceutical or even life science companies partnering with some of these cell-based meat companies and providing them some of the technical expertise that they may need to scale to the next level. And if that does happen, what, what would be the implications of having pharmaceutical and life science companies directly involved in our food system? Could that, could that possibly lead to a future where food becomes medicine? A lot, of, a lot of potential implications that could happen out of that that we don't know just yet, but it will likely happen to help accelerate the field to, to the next level. And you mentioned the idea of space again. And I think that I just want to wrap, wrap up with almost one of those stories about how the field has come full circle. The first idea of cell cultured meat came out from a NASA supported research paper back in the early 2000s about growing goldfish meat for, for potential application of astronauts growing and eating out of space for long, for long um, space missions. And that, I, that paper stemmed interest from some people interested in the idea of the field that launched the first nonprofit focused on cell agriculture, New Harvest. And through that nonprofit, New Harvest, the first and through connections that came afterwards, the first self-cultured meat burger prototype in 2013 took place. And from that, this whole field has, has exploded around the world. And in 2019, going full circle, Other Farms actually was a company that grew the first piece of cell-based meat in outer space. It's, it's, it's the way this field has come a long way in a few short years, not decades, just a few short years. And it's really exciting to see what, what happens with the field moving forward. That's amazing. And that's so true. So we're at the cusp uh, of sustainability and the Paris Agreement right now that we have before the decade is out. So nine years before we need to reach the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, which is similar to the situation that John F. Kennedy was in when he announced to Congress asking for money. It says we're going to put men on the moon. Um, they also only had a decade to do that. There have been no official announcements from the uh, ag, cell ag industry or the uh, uh, agriculture, food and beverage industry that, you know, okay, before this decade is out, but all the movement. Oh, sorry, Mark, um, you yeah? froze over there for me. I didn't hear this last question. You're back right now. Okay. But, uh, there have been no initial announcements uh, from the cell agriculture industry or the agriculture food and beverage industry that says before this decade is out, uh, we will fix our food systems and come up with these new products for the future and the new solutions on how our system works. Um, but we do have those two examples that we're currently in one was JFK go, or that we were in going to the moon and currently with the sustainable development goals. But because food is our basic resource and the trends that we're seeing, I believe we will do it in a decade and we will see some amazing changes in these fields. Uh, and I hope for the better, one that is 
more regenerative and local and healthy. Um, really, if we can fix human health and human suffering, which is a food issue, um, uh, we, we're going to do a lot to, to end up on our environmental goals and repair uh, our, our global grand challenges. The only announcement that I would say has come close was 2020 when UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres announced the Food System Summit. So it's a step in the right direction. It's also tied with the Sustainable Development Goals, which has the deadline of 2030, which is before the decade is out. So maybe we could look at it as that and players from all over the world are coming together to participate in these summits and to talk about food. And I, I, I can see it at uh, kind of this overview perspective. And uh, those companies that I talk about or talk to in this space, they're all talking sustainability on their tongues and how can we do the environment? How can we produce in a way that doesn't harm animals, but also harm our environment and fixes these things? So I'm very optimistic that we are, we're going to have some wonderful things come and emerge and move forward in, in that Um how do you feel about this and all your work as, as far as that you do, how do you feel about sustainability and, and could you answer the question, what you're going to do before this decade is out, I will do what? Oh, I like that. So in terms of this idea of sustainability, I think what ultimately if, if, if our global population is going to be closer to 10 billion people, between 9 and 11 billion people by the year 2050, we're going to need to find a, many more ways to pr produce a lot more food than we currently do in a more sustainable manner to be able to meet that growing demand without, without depleting more resources that, have, that we're already consuming to produce food. Now technologies like cell agriculture and other alternative proteins and now technologies are going to be part of that solution system that I imagine many more food and agriculture companies are going to adopt to be more sustainable. In terms of what I'm looking to do to help to help improve the sustainability of the world, I will advocate for still agriculture and make sure it's and hope for it to be done correctly to help create a sustainable future food system for everyone. The the last two questions about your ebook and kind of about what you do and and, and about uh, cell agri in general are that I would like you to address and, and why they're important and why you've decided to offer these and kind of a little bit more what they're about. One is the investment report. I'd just like to, why, why that's important. Why should we look at that? What does that tell us? And, and when you bring that out every year and how, how is that going? How is the resonance? And then the second is really, why did you start offering the five day guided course and what is that about and how can we sign up and what does it cost? And, Tell us a little bit more about those two things, please. Sure thing. So I can start with the five-day course. After launching the 2020 edition of the Cell Agri Introduction to Cell Agriculture ebook, some of the feedback I received was it's a bit too dense or in-depth of a resource for someone who is brand new to the cell agriculture field and wants to get a primer to the field. And that's how the idea of the five-day guided course came out. For five days, we will send you an email once a day to your to your inbox, break, breaking down a basic key concept, a simple but key concept behind the cell agriculture field. And that'll help you, that, that'll help the individual get into the idea of what this field is, why it matters, and what, what, what else can I do to get involved in this field? And essentially get, get them into the idea of what is cell agriculture. And if they're still interested, then they can dive into a deeper, re, deeper read like the Cell Agri ebook. And if they're still interested after that, Cell Agri has the first jobs board de dedicated to the widest cell agriculture field. So, so, so they can get involved even through that, essentially trying to create a virtual ecosystem around the field. And hopefully that, that five-day guided course can help people sign up for free and learn more about the field. Um, you know, when, when we talk about the investment report, one of the reasons why the field has done so well in the last five years is through the number of investments coming into the field. Up to this point in time, most investments have come from more mission aligned investors, those looking at making a future food system that is animal free, and that's helped the field get, get to where it is at, to this point. Essentially, to get to the, to get, to get to the next level, we'll, we'll need a wider range of investors to come to this field. And one of the goals of the Salagri Investment Report series is to 
help more investors and, and those type of people learn about the solid agriculture field and figure out opportunities for them to get involved in as well to one, support the field and, and two, understand what's going on as the field moves forward. The investment report series to, to that extent is broken down into two sections. One, it breaks down how as of summer 2020, over $1 billion has now been invested into the solid agriculture food ecosystem. A billion dollars, a few years ago, this field didn't even exist. So the first part of that report series breaks down how a billion dollars have been invested into the food ecosystem as of the end of May 2021 for context, it's now $1.5 billion. So that's how fast this field is growing. And that just breaks down the, the, the different company profiles as well as how investments have gone into the field and what, what opportunities are there for investors to get involved to help further grow the field. And the second part of that report series breaks down the cell agriculture supply chain. We talked about it earlier. How do we move from lab bench scale all the way to commercial production? That's a lot of key challenges and key pain points there. And if investors are interested, there are a lot of opportunities that to get involved in the field as well. And, and, and so that part of the report series breaks down the key pain points, why they're important, and potential startups or companies that could even enter the ecosystem or today and help address those key pain points to move us from that lab bench scale all the way to commercial production. So that's, that was the goal behind the Celagri Investment Report Series. It was launched at the end of 2020, and we'll be, we'll be launching updates to that one soon. That's amazing. I only have uh, four more questions for you. And this, this next one is absolutely the hardest that you'll have today. And then, then you can wipe your brow and quit sweating. Um, but here's, here's, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, although you might have said that during this crazy time. It's What's the futures? What's the future? And, and somehow you've kind of tickled it already, but for you, what's the future? Uh, I think when it comes to our food system, I think the future is going to be full of, full of choices and full of options for everyone. And that makes it really exciting. You could, um, if still agriculture comes commercially viable and you have lots of products on the market along with other alternatives like plant-based or fungi-based as well as conventional animal-based animal products, Consumers don't have a wide range of options available to them. And, and in, in that effect, all these products will be competing with each other to be more sustainable and better and healthier for everyone. So I think we're gonna have a, we're gonna come with a food system in the future that is a lot more sustainable and full of more options for consumers. Like you said, I touched on this idea that because of a growing demand for food and more limited resources than before, more companies as well would be looking for options to make our food system more sustainable or from general food industries to the wider agriculture industries as well to make sure we can sustainably farm as how we, how we do and find other technology to help us further enhance to the next level to make sure we have enough food to feed 10 billion people by the year 2050. I think that's, that's how our future system, system's gonna look like looking, moving forward. And on a personal note, I'm looking forward to a cell culture chicken thicker as well one day. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, the last three questions are for my listeners, really, um, so that they can get a little bit more insight on how they can move forward. Young uh, innovators can go forward in this field. If there was one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Ooh, one, one message. That's you, a couple I'll, one, but I'll it, give you a couple so you can do whatever you feel best about. Mm -hmm. I think the idea that when it comes to the future of food, it, it, it is how we build it. That's, what, that's so exciting. If you want to build a more sustainable future food system, it can be done. And we just, and we just don't need scientists. We need engineers. We need, we need people who understand the business of it. We need a whole range of talent and expertise. If you don't get involved in this future food field, but don't feel you have the science background, don't you worry. We're, we're going to need everyone on board to create a future food system so that there's going to be space for you to get involved. That's amazing. I, I say that quite a bit. It's not really about the, the products of the future, the brands of the future, the food types or food types of the future. It's really about how we produce the food exactly. and, uh, for the future. Do we use uh, renewable energy and battery storage and no aromas, flavors, preservatives, sugars, on and on? 
uh, and make sure that they're chemical and pesticide free and that they're healthy and good for humanity. I think that it's virtually impossible to have a bad tasting product, a bad product for human health and a bad product that has a big environmental impact. And so I, I like that answer that you give. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Ooh, I think in terms of making an impact, cell agriculture, while it's very, very much spoken about in, within the future food circles, to the wider public, people still aren't really aware or understand this technology in terms of that we can actually produce food products directly from cells. To, to, to get started, I think the first thing that I tell everyone is raise awareness for this field, start writing, start, start sharing content, or start finding ways to get involved with the field in terms of making your own groups locally or communicating to people around you about what this field is and not just how it works, but again, why are people looking into it? I think from that point, when you start sharing some messages about that, as you, as you, as you get more into the field, there'll be many more opportunities for you to help support it. And the last question I have for you is, what have you experienced or learned so far in your academic and professional journey that you would have loved to know from the start? Or you said, oh, I wish I would have known that. Oh, wow. I wish something I wish I knew from the very beginning is don't be afraid to um, share, 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 share your content. It, it doesn't matter how early on you feel, the work speaks for itself. Once you, put your, once you put your work out there, it's easier to reach out to other people and get further involved in any ecosystem. Don't be afraid to put your work out there. Ahmed, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure to talk to you about cell agriculture and really um, your plethora of knowledge. I'm looking forward to next year's ebook coming out. I'm looking forward to the 2021 investment report. And I would encourage everybody to go out and go to your website. We're going to put it in the show note and the descriptions where they can go and where they can find you and get in touch with you and look at the works that you're providing. That's all I have for, for you today, unless there's something you left out or last words that you would like to depart. I, I'm done and I really thank you. I think, I think that was, I think we covered everything. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me on, on your show. It's been really great to talk about how, how cell agriculture can help build our future food system. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, take care.